Hi there, this is Hot Pocket Remix. In this video, I'm going to go over the tools used in making event script modifications, as well as making a simple mod. You can see that I've already opened the emetf documentation file here and the enum documentation file here, and I've copied common.emevd.dcx from my Dark Souls event directory and uncompressed it into common.emevd using Wolf's BND rebuilder. I've also downloaded the Python files that I wrote to work with the emevd files, and I've placed them in this directory as well. The first step is to decode the emevd file into the numeric version that we can edit. To do so, we use a command for emevd rebuilder. So I'm going to use Python emevd rebuilder. And now I'm going to unpack common.emevd, and I'm going to use the dash n flag to say that it should be a numeric output. And by the way, if you forget what uh, flags do, you can always use dash h to get a short description of all the flags that you need. So now I'm going to use dash o. I don't want it to just print out here in the command prompt. I want it to save it to an output file. And I'm going to name it something meaningful. It doesn't really matter, but I'm going to go with common.unpack.txt. Okay, and you can see that appears over here. And it does look like the numeric file that you're used to. Now, we're going to go through the process of making a simple mod. Normally, I would show how to produce the verbose version from a emevd file as well, but we're going to be doing that in the process of making the mod, so I won't do it now, but you would use the dash v flag if you are curious, but we'll see that in a bit. For now, I'm going to add a custom event to common, which if you recall, runs in every area of the game. So this is going to be an event that always uh, occurs no matter what map we're in. So I've looked through the emev file looking for some interesting commands to use, um, but not too complicated. And I've come up with the idea of making a script that detects if you have a soul of a lost undead, one of these very small soul items. And if you do, if you do have one in your inventory, then it is going to use it for you. So you're not going to be able to hold on to them for later. It's going to instantly use them as you find them. So the first step that we need is to give our event uh, a unique ID. So my event is going to be ID number something that doesn't already exist. You can look through these files and find something that doesn't already exist. And I've done that ahead of time. I know that 8099 is an event ID that is not already in use, so I'm going to use that. Now, I need to add comma zero. This is a flag that I don't actually know what it does. It's zero, one, or two, most commonly zero, and I think it controls something to do with when the event is executed. I think zero means it's executed every save and load. One might mean something like it's executed every time you sit down at a bonfire, these sorts of things. It's not clear to me exactly what the differences are, but most of them use zero, so we'll use zero here. Now, the next thing we need to do is actually write some commands. So the first command we're going to need is a conditional, and it checks to see if you have the item in your inventory. So that's what I'm showing here. You can see it's instruction class 3, and it's condition PC has item. So it's the player character has the item, or does not have the item. And it's instruction index 4. Okay, So we come over here, we're going to enter that in. You don't need to line it up like this, but I like to. So it's 304, and then if we look back in the emev, it has signature b b i b so we'll type that in as well this lets the packer know what the parameters types are without having to go consult the emetf every single time so 
we have four arguments, so we'll need to put in four values. The first one is enum register. So this is going to be the register that the condition is going to be saved into. I'll say more about that in a second. Let's go look at the enums file for the registers. There they are. So there are 15 registers here. And these control the program flow by setting up condition groups. Now, I'm calling them registers here. It's more proper to think of them as condition groups where we actually build a condition that the game waits for to be true. It's not constantly executing these and saying if it's true or false. Instead, it builds something like an event listener, if you're familiar with that, and waits for that to be true. So here we only have a very simple condition, which is all we're checking for is if the player has the item. So we're not storing this in an AND or an OR register or anything like that, building something more complicated. We're just going to store it directly into the main register. So our first thing is zero here. If we go back to the emetf, our next argument is item type. You can see here enum item type. And so if we come back to the enums documentation, item type here takes on one of four values weapon, armor, ring, or item. Uh, we're looking for the soul of a lost undead, so that's a consumable item or any other item that doesn't fall into one of those three categories. Typically, you're going to be working with items, but we could have been checking for armor or, or weapons, these sorts of things. Okay, so the next one is the item ID. Now, I have to go look this up. You can either use the debug executable, which Shadowed Image pointed out to me is incredibly useful for this type of thing, uh, or you can use some param files. They say what the items are and so on. Either one is fine. Uh, and I've looked that up ahead of time, so I know that the soul of a lost undead here corresponds to item 400. And finally, we have owned state, so this is enum owned state, so I'll come back over here. And enum owned state is either 0 or 1. I don't know why they didn't just use a boolean enum, such a thing already exists, we'll see it later on, but in any case we're going to be looking at uh, owns. We, we want to check to see if the player owns this item, not that they don't own this item, so we'll say 1 here. So now we have a conditional that's going to wait until the player owns the soul of a lost undead. So what we want to do is now actually have them use it. Unfortunately, there's no simple command to just say, okay, use this item. Instead, we're going to have to construct all the things that happen when you use the soul of a lost undead manually. And we'll see that we actually don't quite get 100% of the way there. And that's partially on me. I don't know if there's a way to get 100% there. Uh, but we're going to do our best. It's going to be close, but not perfect. So the first thing I want to do is, well, actually, we'll put in a delay. So I don't want this to take place instantly. We're going to give the player a second or two in order to realize that they've picked up a soul of a lost undead. And if they know that this is happening, they don't necessarily want to be jumping off a cliff or fighting an enemy when they know they're going to immediately get thrown into the animation where you use this soul item. So let's look up the command for waiting, and I happen to know that it is here. Wait for a set number of seconds. It's a very easy instruction to use. So it is 1001 and 0. And it has signature F, just a single float. And if we look over here, that float is just the number of seconds to wait. So this isn't particularly important. Let's make it three seconds. OK, we still haven't actually done anything. So our next goal is to have the player actually perform the animation where they hold the soul out in front of them and crush it. If you've played the game, you'll certainly be familiar with this animation. It's the one you use when you crush souls, also uh, humanity uh, and, and boss souls, of course. So we need the player to play an animation. And there's two animation commands uh, that I'm aware of that would be useful here. 
uh, but instead we're going to use just one of them, which is animation playback request. There's also an animation playback force, uh, but here we're not wanting the player to instantly snap into that animation. If they're rolling or something like that, we'll let the roll finish, uh, and then it will put this on the animation queue. Uh, we could snap them into that animation, but in some sense that's a little uh, jerky and we don't necessarily want to do that. So this is 2003-01 and it has signature IIBB, so two ints and then two bytes. And if we come back over here, we can see the first one is the entity ID, this, the entity ID that we're going to target with the animation. So that's the player. And it's convention here that entity ID 10,000 is always the player. So you can even see in some of these other events here, there's 10,000s there's around here. That's going to be referring to the player. The next one is the animation ID, and this is where the debug executable is incredibly handy because you can see what animations your character is currently playing at that time. And so I've gone off and figured out what the animation that we need is, and it's 7501. Okay, the other two are booleans. I'm not going to go bother looking up in the enum what the uh, allowed values are. I know there's 0 or 1, with 0 being false and 1 being true. You could probably guess that if you know anything about uh, booleans. But they are, should this thing loop, and should it wait for completion? Well, we don't want the animation to loop. We just want it to play once, so we'll make this false. But we do want to wait for the animation to complete before we continue on with our event. Otherwise, all this, the rest of this stuff is going to happen before the animation is even completed. And we don't want that. So we will say wait for completion true. Okay, so now the player is going to hold out their hand as if they're crushing the soul. They're going to do so, and then nothing's going to happen. They'll still have this in their inventory. So they're just going to continue doing this every three seconds until the player gets incredibly angry that we've softlocked their game. So what we need to do is two things. We need to remove the item from their inventory, and we need to actually give them the 200 souls that they would otherwise receive if they were using the item directly. Here we're just playing the animation. The item isn't actually being used, so no effects take place. So the first thing that we're going to do is remove the item from their inventory, and I'm going to find that command for you just so you can see it. So it is here, remove items from player, and it has item type, item ID, and quantity. I'm not going to go too deep into that because I think it's uh, reasonably clear what all those things should mean. So again, you can probably guess it's three and four hundred again, and quantity I will say one. Uh, although I found that I think it removes all of them in your inventory, no matter what quantity you say. So uh, you have to be a little careful with using these things. But just in the spirit of this mod, maybe it'll happen to work. Uh, I will put quantity one to say remove one of them, but I don't think that actually works. Okay, so now it's going to remove it from their inventory, but it's still not giving them the actual souls. So currently this makes it look like they've used the item, it removes it from their inventory, but no effect actually occurs. So this would be a very mean thing to do. So we actually need to give the player 200 souls. Now if you scroll through the emetf, there's no command for giving the player souls. So how do we do this? Well it turns out that all of this stuff is handled through buffs and debuffs. Now, you're probably familiar with debuffs like the Calamity Ring or um, buffs that you might give yourself like the Red Tearstone Ring. But basically all effects in the game are handled through buffs and debuffs. And one of those is when you pop a soul item, it actually temporarily gives you a buff that gives you 200 souls, say, if you're using the Soul of Lost Undead. So we will need to have a command here that actually gives us a buff or debuff. And these are called special effects in uh, the game's terms, although I tend to avoid using that terminology because, well, we think of special effects as being you know, visual effects, which the game calls SFX, kind of confusingly. 
and we'll see something about I don't know enough about SFX, so we'll see that it, it's actually missing from this command. Um, and I'll, I'll so show that in a second. So we need a command that will actually give us a buff, and that command is the following set special effect. So again, you should read this as set buff or debuff rather than a special effect. So it just takes in two parameters, an entity ID, which is going to be 10,000 again, and the special effect ID. So let me add this command. Oops. And as I said, 10,000. And the debug exe has a list of all the special effects that are currently being applied. There's also a parameter file that details all of the effects and what they do, all of the buffs and debuffs and what they do. And I've gone ahead and looked up what exactly the buff is that gives you uh, 200 souls, the one that you get when you use a soul of a lost undead, and it's uh, 3270. Okay. You can look that up in the parameter file if you like. Okay. So it seems like we should be done. We've detected that the player has the item, wait for a bit, cause them to play the animation, remove the item, and give them the souls. But we're not quite done. That's because when an event reaches the end of its list, it will permanently terminate unless it's started again. And if it started again, that means that the player has reloaded the game or something like this. We want this to run over and over again because the player is probably going to find more than one soul of a lost undead before saving and quitting the game. So we need something that will unconditionally restart. And there is such a thing. Here it is, unconditional event end. And you might be thinking, wait a second, we don't want the event to end. But this command is responsible for saying, okay, the event is done, how should we terminate it? Now, if it in occurs in the middle of an event, we might just say, oh, it's going to end the event. But it does have event end type. And this is a enum that tells us how the event is going to end. So I will show you that enum. And you can see it has two values, end and restart. And we want it to restart. So I will come back over here and put that command in. So it's 1004, and it takes a single byte, and we want one for restart. OK, so this is the event that we've written. Now, if I saved and packed this up, it still wouldn't work. And the reason is nothing ever actually starts this event. So we need to come all the way to the start of the file. And there's two important events here. One of them is very long. I just scrolled past it. It's zero. And the other one is 50. There's 50. 50 is also quite long. 50 and zero are special events. 50 is the pre-constructor that runs basically as soon as you load into the game. And it's responsible for setting up uh, certain event flags and all these other things and also initializing certain important events. But the one we're interested in is zero, which is the constructor, which is responsible for basically initializing every single event in this file. Now, your first instinct is, if you're a programmer, probably to go to the end of the constructor and put the event there. Uh, unfortunately, because you might have a situation where you're using the unconditional event end or something like that in the middle here, you might not realize that one of those are in there, and so your event will never get initialized. So to be safe, I like to put my event in an appropriate location, but I want this to run all the time, so I'll put it as close to the start as I can. Now, I happen to know that these first four commands here aren't actually uh, commands that change program flow at all, so I will put my initialization command here, and you can probably guess that it's 2000 zero. Okay, and if we now check 2000 zero, I happen to know it's right at the start, it's very important, initialize event, it takes in three parameters, like so, 
And you can see that this actually has a weird signature. These next three commands break that pattern somehow. I'll say more about that when we start talking about uh, parameter substitution and passing arguments to events, uh, which I will say more about in a future video. But for now, we don't need to worry about that. So these three parameters are event slot number, event ID, and arguments. And as I said, we don't have any arguments here. So event slot number will be zero. It's always zero unless you're doing something involving uh, parameter substitution. You can see there's a one and a two in these next ones. Not super important for right now. And then we need the event ID. Well, we know that's 8099. And any arguments to pass? No. So we'll just put a zero. Okay. And we'll save that. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that this actually looks correct. So rather than instantly packing it up and trying it out in game, I want to make sure that this actually looks like the right thing. So we'll come down here to our command prompt. And again, we will do Python emev rebuilder. And now rather than reading from common.emev, I want to read from this numeric file. So we're going to do dash p to say, okay, now parse from a numeric file rather than from a .emev file. And common.emev. Now it's common.unpack.txt. And now rather than writing out a numeric file, of course we could, but it wouldn't do anything. It would just duplicate this file. We want to write out a verbose version. And again, the output here is some file name. Let's call it common.verbose.txt. Okay. And you can see that appears over here. And there's our initialize event, 8099. And if we go down to the end of the file, you can see here is our new event that we just wrote. So event ID is 8099. If player owns item 400, then wait three seconds, request animation playback, etc. Remove one. Well, as I said, that might not actually remove just one. I think it removes all of them. And give the player a special effect. And then restart this event. Now we don't have to worry, by the way, in case you're wondering, we don't have to worry about the player permanently having this 200 souls effect. Uh, the effect has a length of zero. So it just immediately applies. Some other effects have 30 seconds or 20 seconds or a minute or something like that. This one has a length of zero. So it just applies it instantly and gives the player 200 souls. Okay. So everything looks fine. So let's pack this up into common.emev. So I'm going to come over here and make a backup of common.emev in case I want to work with it later. Uh, this is why I suggest doing this in a temporary directory so you're not just overwriting your actual game files. And again, we will do Python, mevd rebuilder. And again, we're parsing from common.unpack.txt. And this time, we don't need a dash n or a dash v flag. By default, it will write us out a dot .emev file will pack it up, so we don't need either of those, and we just say dash o common dot .emev, okay? And you can see that common dot .emev has appeared here. So now I'm going to use Wolf's BND rebuilder to pack it back into the dot .dcx file, replace it in my game, and then start it up, and we'll take a look at it. So I will do that all in a second. And I'll be right back. Okay, here we are in Firelink Shrine. I've made a new character, ran through. And I know there's a Soul of a Lost Undead around here. In fact, there's a couple of them. So let's go take a look at what happens when we pick one of them up. And we'll see our script working in real time. Now, as you can see, this looks pretty close to what you would expect, but we are missing the visual effects, which what the game calls SFX, uh, that actually makes it look like you're holding the soul and crushing it. Now, unfortunately, as I said, 
I don't actually know how to trigger that. I don't know how to make that happen. So for this simple mod, we'll just leave it at that. Well, maybe there is no event command that actually uh, produces SFX like that. I know there are commands that produce SFX like when you sit at a bonfire, then that screen clearing animation comes up. That's a, a visual effect that is triggered by an event script. But I'm not sure how the special effects that appear during animations and these sorts of things are actually produced. So that's that's something else that we have to look at. But you can see, if I f go find another soul, we actually do have something that looks approximately correct, even if it's not perfect.